uh, it's June 4th, 2020. And so I wanna thank everybody for being here. I, this may be the most challenging time in our lives, more than likely. And I appreciate everyone taking the time to be on a call about shoreline preservation, which in light of everything we're addressing may not seem important uh, to in big picture, but what we've seen in the last few months is that uh, our access to the shoreline and our love for the shoreline and the need for the shoreline and a big one, a big one that we can socially distance at became an overwhelming priority for San Diegans and Southern Californians and actually people around the country and around the world. So uh, I think for all of us in the shoreline preservation business that may have been the only bright spot, uh, I think, in this, uh, this whole arena. It highlighted the important work that we're doing that brings people together. So uh, with that, before we jump into the meeting, I will ask our clerk to confirm that we have a quorum. Tessa, do we have a quorum? Yes, Chair, we have a quorum for this meeting. Great. Um, and because this is a new process for us, and as a chair, I'm reading a script, a very, very well-prepared script. Um, so bear with all of us. I do appreciate all the work that our SANDAG staff, and I'm sure all of you who work with cities know how much effort and time it's taken to manage these virtual meetings. Um, and so again, because this is a new process for all of us, I'm going to ask our clerk to go over some basic instructions for both working group members and members of the public to participate in the meeting. Uh, take it away, Tessa. Thank you. Um, first, for the working group members, your microphone is muted by default. It's very important that you do not click your microphone icon or you will self-mute and we will not be able to unmute you. If you have a question or a comment or would like to make a second or um, a motion or a second, click on the raise hand icon in the control panel. The chair will be able to see a list of all the working group members who have raised their hands and will call on you at the appropriate time and you will be unmuted. Your microphone icon at the top right of your screen will turn from red to green. Again, do not click the microphone icon yourself. If you mute yourself, we cannot unmute you. After you make your motion or your comments, you will be muted again and the chair will proceed on to the next working group member in line. The chair will call on staff to present each item. After each presentation, we will follow our normal process. If you have a question, raise your hand and the chair will call on you. We will then take public comment, which will be described in a moment. Working group members can then offer comments on the item by raising their hands. As before, the chair will call on members who have raised their hands and unmute each individually. Although there is a comment box into which you can type, we will not be using that function. If you would like to make a motion or second a motion, please raise your hand. The chair will recognize you in the same manner as for questions and comments. Your microphone will be unmuted. For voting, by state law, all votes in a teleconference meeting must be by roll call vote. Sorry. And there has been a, after there has been a motion and a second, the clerk will call the vote of each jurisdiction individually, and that member will be unmuted to vote. At the conclusion of voting, the clerk will announce the result of the vote. If your vote was entered incorrectly, please raise your hand at this time and the chair will call on you to correct the vote. Also, for clarity of the record, please identify yourself each time you speak. For members of the public, public comments that were emailed to the clerk in advance of the meeting and received by 4 p.m. yesterday were provided to all members in advance of today's meeting. Sorry, the public can also email comments during today's meeting. Those should be sent to clerk at sandag.org. Identify the item number to which the comments pertain and the name of the commenter. After the conclusion of each presentation and after any work group questions, we will take public comments. The clerk will then read all comments that were submitted during the meeting. Mindful of the meeting duration, the chair will set a limit of one minute per comment. If a comment takes more than that time to read only the first minute will be read but the entirety of the comment will be made a part of the meeting record mayor didina back to you uh thanks so much and so we've already seen this is um this is not hollywood perfection here so we all if you hear any jets or helicopters or the sound of gunfire from my computer it's because i'm just south of a navy seal training base 
And yesterday, in fact, uh, when we were doing a Zoom meeting, there was the rat tat tat of the Navy SEALs training. I'm, I'm assuming it wasn't live fire, but um, you don't know. And I know I see Bill Councilmember Sankey's on the call, so he may have heard that uh, a few miles north of me. Anyway, um, with that, again, thanks for the reminder. Please raise your hand to make comments or motions. And since this is my first time managing one of the many platforms that I manage uh, with the hand raising um, button, please be patient and bear with us and, uh, and just go with the flow, uh, catch the wave when we address maybe some of the technical glitches or me trying to manage two laptops um, and, 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 and then the hand raising. Um, please do not mute yourself. Staff will unmute you once your name is called. And with that, let's start with item number one, welcome and introductions. You know, usually we go around the room and introduce ourselves, but because of the format of the meeting today, we're going to skip that. It may be more complicated, um, although we miss all of you doing that. It's maybe the best part of the meeting. Um, instead, I'd like to thank everyone for attending to get today and then would like to extend a welcome to some new members of the working group. And again, I just wanted to comment. I know we have a pandemic and then obviously um, people concerned and protesting about the issue of racial violence and around the country. And it's very clear that our beaches uh, historically have provided a place for all of us to come together. Um, and whether it's the pandemic or um, to be the best of us. And so I think that's something all of us appreciate and understand more than ever why it's so important for people to have access, everyone to have ac equitable access to our coast and ocean for every, every family, every person from every community to be able to enjoy our coastline. So this, this committee's uh, even has, I think, more importance today. We realize the importance of this committee and this type of work. Um, anyway, um, and so now we're moving on to item number two, approval of meeting minutes. And the Shoreline Preservation Working Group has asked to review and approve the minutes from a December 5th, 2019 meeting. Staff has informed me that one additional name, Serena Mil Milne, it needs to be added to the attendance sheet for the December 5th meeting. That name will be added to the final approved minutes. Do we have any member comments or questions? Uh, Mr. Sankey, I see your name, uh, your hand is up. Now this is a question, do I unmute Mr. Sankey? Yeah, no, not so much a question, I was just gonna move the, uh, move the item, approve it. Oh, thank you, Mr. Sankey, okay. Is there a second? Nope. And I see Mr. Warden, uh, Councilmember Warden. I mean, I second. Great. I second the motion. Great, thank you. Um, great. And do we have any additional member comments or uh, questions? Great. We did get a second. And now I will ask the clerk to begin the roll call vote, please. Tessa. Thank you, Chair. I would also like to confirm that there are no public comments on this item. And hopefully my dogs will be quiet while I do this. City of Imperial Beach, Chair Serge Dedina. Aye. City of Del Mar, Vice Chair Dwight Warden. Go ahead, yes. I believe City of Carlsbad is absent. City of Chula Vista is absent. Uh, City of Coronado, Council Member Bill Sankey. Coronado, I. Oh, I'm. I apologize. I do see um, Deputy Mayor Patel. Patel is on for uh, City of Carlsbad. Go ahead. Yep, I'm here. This is Priya. And your vote on the and minutes. I, I, I vote. I vote I. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to City of uh, Encinitas, Deputy Mayor Kelly Hines. Can
Kelly. Oh, there you, there you are. Thank you. You're self muted. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Uh, city of National City is absent. City of Oceanside, Councilmember Ryan Kime. As this is my first meeting, I wasn't um, on the working group in December, so I'm going to abstain. Thank you. City of Solana Beach, Deputy, Deputy Mayor Judy Hagenauer. Aye. County of San Diego is absent. Oh, I see uh, Council Member Ron Morrison, you are self-muted. If you could unmute, we could register your vote. Your vote. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Court of San Diego, Commissioner Dan Malcolm. Yes. And U.S. Navy, Walter Wilson. Aye. That item passes with three member agencies absent. And I'm sorry, I see Jennifer Campbell has her hand raised. Council member, I'll go ahead and unmute you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you didn't count, uh, call City of San Diego? I did not. It's not on my list. I apologize. Okay. And you're... I, I would abstain as I missed that meeting. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Back to you, Chair. Great. Thank you so much. Um, are there, I just want to make clarify any additional public comments or member comments. It sounds like there aren't. Um, one comment I would like to provide, I think um, maybe a virtual round of applause is due to the amazing SANAC staff led by Keith Greer and then acknowledging the city of Oceanside and the city of Carlsbad for the absolutely uh, beautifully done um, agreement to do the restoration for Buena Vista Lagoon. I think some of us on the SANDAG board remember that came back to SANDAG to kind of figure that out and the really uh, complicated and extensive stakeholder engagement, the consultative process, um, the really the collaborative process, the consensus driven process, everything that coastal management is supposed to be which makes it really hard. And um, I think uh, Sarah and I were talking, uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before when we were discussing this meeting. And I, I think for me, as someone who's been involved with coastal management for a long time, um, this is exactly the kind of process you wanna see, but it takes time. Um, bringing people together around the table to come up with a process that works for everybody and balancing all those competing interests and putting really these natural climate solutions to work for adaptation and improving really not only ecological integrity of, of the ecosystem or the ecosystem uh, health, but also human health, as well as uh, really access to the coast. Um, and then the whole issue of natural climate solutions and, and sort of a natural adaptation process. So well done, Keith and the Sandag staff, but also I know all of you from Oceanside and, and Carlsbad who supported that process, as well as of course the Sandag board and everybody else, other stakeholders, very, very well done. And really pleased to see that it's exactly the kind of model um, that we'll hopefully see as we move forward in, in adapting and, and, and restoring uh, our coastline. So with that, I think we have item, Sarah will uh, go ahead with item number four, which is the shoreline management program staff update. Sarah? Sure, I'm ready to go, Mayor. I just wanted to confirm, I did just see one hand raised, um, Mr. Dirk Akema. So just wanted to confirm if that was public comment or a mistake. I'm not seeing a mic open for Dirk. He has no mic connection.
Okay, I guess we can we can move on then. And then if there is a way for connection, we could possibly take that comment at the end if, if there was in fact a comment. Um, so thank you, Mayor Dedina, for getting us started. And I apologize if you can hear my dog shaking in the background. Um, I wanted to take just a few minutes here at the beginning of the meeting to introduce myself to the new members of the group and provide a few updates from the staff level. Um, for those of you who are new to the group, I'm the staff liaison, and if you ever have questions about the materials for the meetings, uh, please do feel free to reach out to me. Um, we're currently working on updating the shoreline section of our SANDAG website, and once we have those updates made, I'll be sure to send out a link to everyone and highlight those changes. So today I wanted to provide three quick updates to the group, um, two on grants and a quick overview of some conversations that we've had with the Regional Water Quality Control Board about the cost of 401 certifications for sand compatibility and opportunistic use programs, more commonly known as SCOOPs. So first, um, some of you will recall that SANDAG's Regional Transportation Infrastructure Sea Level Rise Assessment and Adaptation Guidance was presented to the Shoreline Preservation Working Group in December. And since then, that document has made its way to the Regional Planning Committee and most recently to the SANDAG Board of Directors on May 8th. So that project is now complete and we'll be submitting the final work products to Caltrans this summer to complete the grant requirements. And as you know, this document along with other local vulnerability assessments will help provide some insight into the next iteration of the regional plan. And we'll also provide information regarding sea level rise vulnerabilities to our SANDAC team um, as we start working on comprehensive multimodal corridor plans or CMCPs for the Central Mobility Hub and the 805 and 5 corridor. So second update, um, some of you will probably recall that last fall we applied for some funding through the Caltrans Sustainable Communities Grant Program to refresh the feasibility study um, that we prepared for the second regional beach sand nourishment project. And the focus of this work was really um, to engage in a conversation with local jurisdictions about lessons learned from the last regional beach sand project, willingness to possibly participate in a future beach sand project, and to start thinking about you know, quantities of nourishment that might be needed. Um, with information from, from both our policy documents, information from our annual shoreline monitoring program that we'll hear Greg Heron discuss later today, and also any insights from many of those local uh, sea level rise assessments that have recently been completed. So we are actually expected to hear if we receive that funding tomorrow. It's been a six month wait and I'll make sure to uh, provide an update to the working group once I have it. So finally, just a quick update on the Regional Water Quality Control Board and the cost of 401 certifications for scoops. So we heard last fall about the extreme jump in costs for this certification for that, for that program. And for many jurisdictions, it's now just too expensive to pay for this type of permit. And that means there could be beach quality sand that becomes available from opportunistic sources, but no beach to place it on because that certification isn't in place. So we've engaged with our legislative team to research this issue at the state level. And we recently found out that the State Regional Water Quality Control Board is hosting a series of meetings over the summer to discuss their fee schedule and any potential changes to those fees. So the next meeting will take place next week on June 9th. And I'll be sure to send that information out to anyone interested as part of my follow-up to this meeting. So SANDAG staff intends to listen into that June meeting, become familiar with the ongoing dialogue regarding fees, and then advocate for changes to the scoop fees um, at a subsequent meeting in August. So once um, changes to the fee schedule are approved internally, uh, those changes would be included in the board's annual revisions to its fee schedule, which would be adopted in the fall. So engaging in these meetings over the summer is really critical to advocating for a lower cost um, for the 401 certification for SCOOP projects. So we do encourage our member agencies to listen in and comment as part of those meetings as well. Um, again, I'll send out information for those act as a follow-up to the meeting today. And I would like to keep this conversation going by reaching out to staff at local jurisdictions. 
Um, if you intend to comment on the fee schedule, it may be useful for us to connect before the August meeting just to ensure that our member agencies have a united ask moving forward. So that wraps up my updates. I realized those weren't as quick um, as I would have liked, but wanted to cover those three items and I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thanks so much, uh, Sarah. I see that council member um, Bill Sankey and then I'm not sure Priya, council member Priya from uh, Bhat Patel from Carlsbad has a question, um, but uh, we can go from start with Bill. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Sarah, Coronado just had a recent experience that actually wasn't very productive on, on reactivating our scoop related to a, a parking garage that's being dug right across the, the walkway from our public beach. And we had asked to move some of that sand, which is glorious, white, beautiful, not polluted sand to our beach. Um, we were able to negotiate with the Regional Quality Control Board to get a, a reasonable number on our fee. The fee wasn't the problem. The problem was the ask of the Coastal Commission they related to um, us stopping a grooming program we have on our beach. And it was very frustrating to have very zero, you know, no linkage between uh, between the need for more sand in that certain part of our beach and, and other activities in the way we manage in our, our, our beach for the benefit of the public. And it, it was a very frustrating experience with the Coastal Commission. And so we simply just gave up. Um, but as I'm looking at that hole get deeper and all that white sand get trucked off the island in, in diesel trucks, um, it just, it really claws at me. So when you bring this up, um, remember it's not just the cost of this with the Regional Quality Control Board, it's finding some kind of reasonable positions from the Coastal Commission in terms of these opportunistic sand uh, replenishments that don't necessarily uh, call for a pound of flesh from a jurisdiction that wants to do something that, that is good for the environment, good for the public, and a, and a, and a reasonable adaptation to sea level rise. Uh, thank thanks you. all for. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Sarah. Oh, that's okay. I was just going to thank Councilmember Sankey for those comments. And then, uh, Councilmember Priya, did you have uh, uh, a, a question? Okay, well, I had a uh, question mark uh, there. Okay. Um, yeah, first, uh, Councilmember Sankey. Oh, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. This is the clerk. I just wanted to let you know first that um, Councilmember Bot Patel is self-muted but she okay. also had a question in the chat which i addressed she just wanted to let you know she's here okay oh good okay and then council member sankey just to follow up on that i, I think imperial beach even shared your frustration because i think we tried to get the sand as well and the, the, exactly the permitting issue so um was not was prohibited and so i think all of us were frustrated with that beautiful sand being carted i think to a dump i'm not sure exactly where i want so i, I do appreciate sarah your proactive approach to this and, and navigating this type of bureaucracy. And I think when we talk about climate change and sea level rise, these types of quick turnaround adaptive projects that don't require millions of dollars that can be deployed immediately, even during emergency situations, uh, when you have coastal flooding, et cetera, are the kinds of things that we're gonna have to be better at. And we had that situation in Imperial Beach with um, coastal flooding last year when we had to work with the, Arm uh, with the Fish and Wildlife Service to address flooding and even when our uh, river mouth flood uh, closed up and we had all kinds of problems with flooding and the permits required just to get the Army Corps to approve opening it up so our city wouldn't uh, be underwater. So um, yeah, thank you, Sarah. Again, really great being proactive and we've got to work at the legislative level, at the state level to make sure that if our state's advocating for us to be adaptive and focus on climate change and sea level rise, then we've got to have a bureaucracy that fits the frame so we don't have, it doesn't take three years to do something that requires attention right now. So uh, yeah, good feedback. And I think that's something we can all coalesce around with coastal cities, because all of us are, have these needs that we need to address. And the more that we can work together on this and uh, from a centralized permitting process, et cetera, it does save money and it allows us to, to move quicker on the ground. So with that, um, I think any additional public comments or comments from the, from the board? Great, um, we'll move on to, now we have item number five, Greg Heron from Coastal Frontiers is joining us today to provide the results of the 2019 Shoreline Monitoring Program. So Greg, please go ahead. Thank you so much for being here. And I'd like to state for the record that there were no public comments on item four. Great, thank you. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, Mayor Dedina. Uh, today I'd like to update you 
on the state of the coast based on last year's shoreline monitoring program. So we'll be talking about the results through fall 2019. Uh, next, please, Arthur. So I understand that there's some new members to the working group and there's likely some first time or occasional attendees um, to the meeting today. So I'll provide some background information to lend some context to the findings. And then we'll talk about the results in terms of literal cells and smaller subreaches within these cells. And I'd also like to touch on beach nourishment, uh, both past and future needs. And then we'll wrap up with some conclusions. Next, please. So you'll recall that our study area extends from the Oceanside Harbor in the north to the U.S.-Mexico border in the south. Uh, we have portions of three literal cells in our study area, uh, Oceanside, uh, Mission Beach, and Silver Strand in the south. And then for, for the purpose of our analysis, we'll break these uh, cells into some smaller subreaches based largely on geographic and municipal boundaries. Um, I apologize, there's a leaf blower outside that decided now was the appropriate time <laughs> to uh, join us. Um, next slide, please. So we know there's been quite a bit of beach nourishment conducted in the region over the last couple decades. This slide summarizes the, the sand that's been placed on the beach since 2001, and that corresponds to uh, the first regional beach sand project. So this is the era where Sandag's actively uh, managing the beach through regional beach sand project one and two, and also the scoop projects that, um, that Sarah mentioned earlier. Um, so we have regional beach sand one and two, about 3.6 million cubic yards. We've also had several opportunistic nourishment projects conducted. That's in the, the bottom table there, uh, nine of them total. Um, four in the Oceanside cell. Most of that material, most of that 500,000 cubic yards of opportunistic nourishment came from one project last year from the San Alijo Lagoon Restoration Project, That's about 450,000 of that 530,000 cubic yards. On Mission Beach cell, we've had one project conducted by the Corps, um, 450,000 cubic yards placed on the beach. And we've had um, four projects conducted in the Silver Strand cell. And again, most of that material came from one project, about 300,000 of that 380,000 from dredging in San Diego Harbor. Next slide, please. So Sandag's been conducting a monitoring program since 1996, and it consists primarily of beach profile surveys conducted in the spring and the fall. So in the spring, we're capturing the winter condition after, after a a winter season of a storm, so it's probably going to be the most eroded condition in terms of beach width that we see. In the fall, it's typically more um, representative of a summer condition, wider beaches after a more um, mild summer wave season. And from this, we are, the surveys go from the back beach to beyond the depth of closure. So the depth of closure, if you recall, is that point offshore where sand's no longer being moved, or significant amounts of sand, or sand is no longer being moved around by waves and currents. So it's the offshore boundary of our closed littoral or sand system. Um, the figure here shows essentially how a beach profile survey is conducted, but it also illustrates what a beach profile is, which is essentially a cross section of the beach. And from that profile, we can get mean sea level beach widths, which is the essentially the the width of the dry sandy beach and calculate that volume of sand in the system from the back beach all the way out to that depth of closure that we talked about. And these are our analysis tools that we look to to uh, assess the condition of the beaches. Next slide, please. So we did have one opportunistic program, a uh, nourishment program conducted last year, about 40,000 uh, cubic yards of sand placed on the beach um, through the city of Encinitas scoop program, and it came from, um, much like the Coronado project that you were describing, um, sand that became available from a resort project nearby. There was also some sand bypassing um, conducted this last year. Um, if you recall, sand bypassing is not adding new sand to the system, but it's restoring sand to the system that's been temporarily lost into the harbor, harbor mouth, lagoon mouth, things like that. Um, 
The three shown here, Oceanside, Harbor, San Alija Lagoon, and Los Penasquitos are conducted every year. Oceanside put a little bit less sand on the beach than they normally do from that harbor. Uh, about the historical average at San Alijo Lagoon and a little bit more than usual at Los Penasquitos Lagoon. So the impact of this is that we would expect to see more sand volume in the Encinitas area from the opportunistic project, maybe a little less um, volume in the Oceanside area because the harbor didn't produce as much sand as usual. Status quo at uh, San Alijo and maybe a little more sand in the system near Torrey Pines adjacent to uh, Los Penasquitos. Environmental conditions the last uh, year, if you recall, we had a little bit above average precipitation, but it, it really didn't change the, uh, the stream flow much. Uh, so the outcome there is we wouldn't expect lagoons to be flush free of sand naturally or expect a lot of sand to be delivered to the beach uh, through rivers and streams. Uh, wave conditions were unexceptional the last year, no large events, so it, we wouldn't expect to see um, a great deal of erosion uh, beyond normal conditions. Next slide, please. Let's talk about the findings. Let's, we'll first look at the current condition, fall 2019, and then step back and see how we got here, um, the long-term evolution between 2000 and 2019. We're starting in 2000 because that's right before SANDAG put uh, sand on the beach for regional beach sand one. So that's really the pre-project condition in this, uh, this beach management era. Uh, we'll look at it in terms of these large littoral cells that we saw on that map and then break it down into some of these finer sub-reaches. And again, we're going to assess the beaches in terms of beach width and shore zone volume. And I think you'll see in some of these that, that these two go hand in hand. If you increase Shore zone volume, you would expect to have an increase in beach width, and vice versa. If you're losing shore zone volume, you would expect to have a diminishing beach widths as well. Next slide, please. So this figure shows the net change in beach width and sand volume in the Mission Beach and Silver Strand cells relative to fall 2000, that pre-RBSB1 baseline. Green shows gains, red shows losses. Um, I think there's an animation, if you'll give it one click, Arthur. Maybe not. Okay. Um, oh, here we go. So in Mission Beach, you see that we have sand volume gains and, and beach width gains uh, that have been maintained over that 19-year that period. One more click, Arthur, and we'll show Imperial Beach, where um, here we, we see we didn't we didn't uh, maintain the volume, but we were able to keep uh, beach widths. And we'll take a closer look at this later when we look at the, the Imperial Beach subreach, but it's a little counterintuitive. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, the same type of information here, but now we're looking at the ocean side cell. Again, green gains, red losses. And we can see that the, the outcome in this larger cell really varies substantially by location. And you know, this, this pattern that we see here tends to become fairly well established maybe five or six years after one, one of the regional beach sand projects. Um, highlights here, uh, if you'll give me a click, Arthur. Solana Beach, Cardiff area, you can see these large gains that we still have 19 years later. Uh, one more click, Arthur, both in beach widths and shore zone volumes, and we see those shore zone volumes extending down into the, the Del Mar area. One more click uh, further to the north, North Carlsbad, this area that has retained sand over this long, long period. So, you know, one thing that's somewhat common between these is, of these areas that have done really well is some compartmentalization or retention features, uh, both man-made and natural in these areas. So for example, in North Carlsbad, we have the North Jetties of Agua Hedionda Lagoon that tend to hold some material up there. In the Cardiff area, it's a pretty short reach, but if you imagine it in your mind's eye, it's somewhat of a crescentic shaped um, beach there along that, that stretch of highway. And you've got the uh, delta from San Alijo Lagoon to the north, and the seaside reef to the south, which seem to be um, 
contributing to holding some of that material there. And then in Solana Beach, uh, again, a fairly short reach, seaside um, reef to the north and the delta from San Diego Lagoon to the south. Um, the gains that we see in La Jolla down there are, are more of a, a new phenomenon, so maybe that's just sand that's starting to eventually make its way down to La Jolla. Next slide, please. So we saw in the previous slides a lot of variability spatially in, in long-term outcome. Um, those graphics didn't show the evolution of the beaches over time and how long we derived benefits from the nourishment. So let's look at the post-RBST1 shoreline evolution in smaller subreaches or smaller size slices through these subreaches. Um, we look at 10 subreaches, but to save time, let's uh, examine a range of general outcomes and then we'll tabulate the pertinent findings for all 10 subreaches that we assess. So figures to, similar to the ones that we're going to see here are included for each of the subreaches in the annual report, along with the, the unique story for each of these subreaches. On this one, we're looking at Solana Beach. This is an example of a beach, again, that did really well in the long term. Um, we're, we're, the chart on the top shows mean sea level beach width change relative to the pre-project condition in blue and shore zone volume change relative to the pre-project condition in red. Uh, we can see at the time of the first regional beach sand project in 2001, that's the uh, dashed vertical line on the left-hand side, we, got, we have gains. Oh, I'm sorry, we didn't advance the slide. I'm sorry, one more, please. Thanks, Arthur. Um, once again, the chart on the top shows mean sea level Beach width changes relative to the pre-project condition in blue, and shore zone volume changes in red. Solana Beach is an example of a beach that did quite well during this period. We can see and after uh, the first regional beach sand project, now that's the dashed line, vertical line to the left side of the chart, we have these gains, largely maintained all the way to the second project where we stepped up again, maintain those gains up until the San Alijo Lagoon restoration material made it on the beach in 2018, and at least two data points in, we're maintaining those gains. So at the end of this this 19-year period, 18-year period, I guess, uh, beaches are about 130 feet wider than when we started, and you can see that we had wider beaches for almost the entire period. I think it's uh, 17 or 18 of those 19 years. This kind of bears out in the photos at the bottom. You can see the pre-nourishment condition and the aerial on the left with uh, wet beaches almost all the way up to the bluff, and then much wider, healthier beaches uh, in fall 2019 to the right. Next slide, please. Uh, Oceanside, um, shown here, it's an example of a subreach where the post-nourishment gains were somewhat transient, lasting for several years, but uh, certainly not enough to call them long-term. Um, Plot on the top again is mean sea level beach width changes and shore zone volume changes relative to the pre-project condition. You can see after, the, <coughs> excuse me, after the first project in 2001, we had these gains in both volume and beach width, and then there's a trend of losses. So we maintained them for maybe four or five, six years initially, and then by the time we got to that second project, we were we were so far in the hole that the project basically just got us back up to the baseline. And then we start to lose material again from there. So at the end of this 19 year period, um, beaches are maybe a little bit narrower than the baseline. Uh, it's important to recognize we, we received benefits from the second project, but again, we were so so far uh, in, in the hole that it really just didn't do more than get us back to, to our starting point. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is South Carlsbad, and um, this is an example of a reach where the benefits or the gains were, were really negligible, despite the fact that, that there were two nourishment projects here, one regional beach sand one and regional beach sand two. We just couldn't hold on to that material. So you see maybe some slight gains after each of the projects, but there's this overwhelming uh, trend of shore zone volume loss and, sh and beach width loss over the period. So we're about 40 feet narrower now than when we started um, in 2000. And from the figures on, or the photos on the bottom, you see that 
we had some really short-term gains right after the sand was placed on the beach from that aerial on the left. But as we look at it now, we have a fairly narrow uh, cobble-dominated beaches along much of this stretch. Um, one more thing to point out, if you remember from, from all three of these slides, we saw that, that the beach width and the shore zone volume tend to trend or track together. As we move on to the uh, next slide, please. Um, Imperial Beach, and this is one where uh, we were able to hold on to beach width gains for several years, um, but oddly the sand volumes don't necessarily track. Um, so we see after regional beach sand one, we get these beach width gains. You see in the 2005-06 period, we get more gains. That's from that um, material placed in the near shore from the harbor, that 300,000 cubic yards. And then we have large gains uh, for regional beach sand too. Remember that project was um, pushing 450,000 cubic yards. That's why those gains are so large. Um, we see losses after each of these projects, but the shore zone volume losses are much um, greater than the, than the beach width losses. So at the end of the period, we do have wider beaches down there by about 40 feet. Uh, looking at the photos on the bottom, pre-nourishment condition, spring 01, uh, pretty wet, looks like some cobbles all the way up to the revetment there. And then on the right, fall 2019, uh, much wider sand beach. Next slide, please. Okay, so I told you we looked at 10 sub-reaches in the area. We looked at examples of um, each of those in the previous slides. So, so all the information here on this slide, it comes from the plots just like we reviewed. So in the second and third columns, we see the number of years where we had beach width and volume gains relative to the baseline condition or pre-RBSP1. And in the last column, we have beach width change at each of these sub-reaches in 2019. And we see again that North Carlsbad, Cardiff, Solana um, performed very well, maintained gains for extended beaches, uh, extended periods. And beaches in 2019 were much wider, ranging from 64 feet wider at North Carlsbad to more than 100 feet wide, wider at Cardiff and Solana Beach. Um, Oceanside and Lucadia show these transient gains we talked about, um, producing benefits for somewhere along the lines of five to six years, uh, with beach widths falling below the pre-project conditions by 2019. And again, we talked about South Carlsbad, where we weren't really able to hold on to sand. Uh, very long at all. Beaches there, almost 40 feet narrow there when we started. Next slide, please. So let's circle back around to beach nourishment. Um, we talked about the 5 million cubic yards of sand that we've placed on the beaches since 2001. And now let's, uh, let's talk about future nourishment. And, you know, I wanted to run through this exercise to estimate the uh, nourishment quantity to achieve a desired outcome in each of the sub-reaches. And this really came about because in conversations with city staff and other stakeholders, it often comes back to the question of, well, what do you want your beach to look like? And I just, this exercise just kind of put some volume numbers to, to what you need to produce a certain beach um, in each of these reaches. And um, so the method we're going to used to, to do this is just the, using the concept of the equilibrium beach profile. And this is essentially how we would include a nourishment project in a shoreline change model, similar to the one that was used to uh, uh, predict the outcome for regional beach sand one and two. Next slide, please. So just briefly, it's a, it's a fairly simple relationship. Um, as long as, as you hold on to a few assumptions. And one is the grain size between the source material and the beach is compa compatible, which means that the pre and post nourishment profiles will have the same shape. Uh, now we're also assuming that the profiles reach equilibrium immediately. We know this is not really the case, um, but it's a, a jump that we have to make. Um, looking at the illustration there at the bottom left, uh, we know when we place sand on the dry beach, the the profile is artificially wide and over steep, and that's the uh, dashed line there. And then as waves and, and currents work on this material, it's going to distribute it across the profile until equilibrium is achieved, and this is represented by the black area on the figure. Um, so this is the beach width that we're calculating, produced by that uh, dark black area on the figure. Um, so in order to, we, we can use this relationship in the lower right, um, 
based on these assumptions to determine the, uh, how much material we need to achieve that beach width. And it's really a function of the the berm height or the height of the uh, the above water beach and the depth of closure and of course the length of shoreline that you want to nourish. Uh, next slide, please. So here are the results for each subreach. Uh, you can see that the length of each reach varies greatly um, with South Carlsbad being nearly uh, five miles, four miles long, and Cardiff and Solana Beach only about a mile long. Um, and of course, this is going to greatly impact the volume requirement. The second column shows the unit volume per foot of shoreline to produce the 50 foot beach width change. Um, and it varies among the reaches because of differences in berm height and mainly depth of closure. So, a shallower depth of closure, you're going to need a smaller volume per unit of length of shoreline to produce this 50 foot beach width gain. And then the third column is the total volume required to affect that change. So it's essentially multiplying the length of the shoreline reach by the unit volume to produce the total volume. And you can see that those volumes range between uh, 1.6 million cubic yards at, at Encinitas, largely because it's a uh, nearly four mile uh, long stretch and it needs 80 cubic yards per foot to produce that change, uh, down to smaller volumes like uh, 300,000 at Solana Beach because it's again a smaller change and a smaller volume uh, per foot of shoreline required. So that relationship that we looked at, it's, it's uh, directly proportional to shoreline length or uh, desired beach width change. So if you want a twice as wide of a beach, a 100 foot wide beach at Solana Beach, that number goes from 312 to 624,000 cubic yards. So it's directly proportion, proportional. Next slide. So um, to, to wrap up on what we just talked about, um, the current condition of the beach versus um, the baseline when we started in 2000 down this road. Uh, shores on volumes, we have more material on the system in the ocean side, but the beaches are generally back to where we started. Um, we did see that there's a lot of variability spatially, so some beaches have done better than others and held on to those gains for long terms. Um, again, subreaches vary, outcome in the subreaches varies a lot, and that has to do with many factors. Um, how big was the regional beach sand fill size? Was there opportunistic nourishment conducted, for example, the slurp project there um, in 2018 or the Corps of Engineers project in Mission Bay? And then what type of interaction did you have with adjacent fills? Um, North Carlsbad clearly benefits from material coming down from Oceanside. And then did each of these reaches have any compartmentalization or retention characteristics like we talked about at North Carlsbad, Cardiff, and Salon, which of course were the, the, the locations that had the most favorable outcome. And uh, we saw areas that just didn't do very well at all, such as South Carlsbad. Next slide, please. So back to nourishment, uh, 5 million cubic yards of sand placed on the beach since 2001, mainly RBSP 1 and 2, but nine very important opportunistic projects. When we look at future nourishment needs, um, I think it's useful first to look back at how much we're putting on the beach now compared to how much we were putting onto the beach in this pre-regional beach sand period or prior to 2000. And we have a deficit in the ocean side cell of 200,000 cubic yards of sand per year that's not making it on the beaches now that was finding its way on the beaches in this earlier period. Um, same with Silver Strand, uh, but it's a much smaller number, only about 20,000 cubic yards uh, per year deficit. And only in the Mission Beach cell do we have a surplus, and that's largely because there wasn't much sand placed on the beach historically in, in Mission Beach. So we looked at the amount of sand required to affect a 50-foot beach width change in in each of the regions, and it varies quite a bit depending on the characteristics of that region, uh, from about 40 cubic yards per foot of shoreline at South Carlsbad to pushing 80 cubic yards per foot in the Encinitas area. Um, when we talk about those nourishment requirements, you know, we're looking at it in very simplistically each of those areas, but it's important to realize that the amount of sand that you need largely depends on how often you do these programs and 
how long material stays in the system. For example, in the Oceanside cell, we're able to build on volume gains after regional beach sand two to increase those for regional beach sand uh, from beach sand one to beach sand two. So, you know, again, it's just just a, a guideline to put some some volume numbers to some of these um, wishes for your beaches that you may have been thinking about. Um, are there any questions? First, thanks, uh, Greg. This is uh, Mary Dina. I really appreciate that. Uh, for us beach data geeks, uh, this is like the best, the, 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 as good as it gets. So, uh, but really important conclusions, and uh, really appreciate that uh, the overview. Um, and so, hold on a second. I'm managing this. Questions, comments. I see that uh, Commissioner Dan Malcolm is up, and then followed by Dwight Ward. Thank you, Commissioner Malcolm. You're on. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for that presentation. Um, I, I've got a question. Back in 1998, um, I was actually on this committee back when it was called the Shoreline Erosion Committee. And back then when we were um, doing the Beach Replenishment Project 1, we were really wrestling with um, the, the cost benefit of of the money versus other alternatives that we had looked at in the past, physical structures and other things to retain sand on the beach. And I, I think your charts are very helpful to show where what happened in those 20 years with, with the two projects and the opportunistic projects. And you know, even though places like Oceanside, South Carlsbad, and Encinitas had um, you know less favorable results than places like Cardiff and Solana Beach. My question is that going forward, as we are going to hopefully allocate more money for projects like this, um, is there any way that you can show or extrapolate what would have happened had we not put that 3.6 million cubic yards on the beach of the planned projects, and then I guess another 1.4 million from the opportunistic projects? If, if you do a side-by-side -side comparison, of the beach gains over 20 years, is there any way for Sandag um, and our contractors to extrapolate what the beach width would have looked like without all that sand going on the beach? Or are there too many variables to, to get an, ap an, an accurate look at what the beaches would have looked like without the projects? Yeah, I think there's a couple ways that you can go about that. You can use the, uh, the data on erosion rates that that um, we've been able to develop with Sandag based on the monitoring and just, as you said, make some extrapolations. Other ways to look at that um, would be shoreline change models. So for example, um, we did a model for the Corps of Engineers where we looked at um, 50, years, 50 years into the future at uh, Oceanside and North Carlsbad under current conditions as you know basically do nothing what what happens to the beaches and then what happens when you put certain nourishments on there so you can kind of do an an apples and apples comparison of uh, what your shoreline might look like under certain uh, management scenarios with these models like that well, well thank you for that you know just for me and i'll cl conclude my remarks um as we go forward and we talk about future funding i think that the stakeholders and the public should you know be informed not only of of the the metrics of the actual projects but also what things would have looked like without them um you know because i i think as uh, mayor dedina said at the outset we all understand and value you, you know what beaches are for our community um as well as you know the the, the adaptative strategies these projects have for our beaches so um, I, I would like to see some of that modeling in the future just to show, you know, what could have been without the projects. You also mentioned the economics of it, and um, Sarah, Sarah, I think, can speak to this, but that, that work has been done using the uh, results of the shoreline monitoring program to uh, develop the economics of, of benefits and costs of these projects. And, uh, you know, none of these projects, whether it's the core or state-funded, get constructed if they don't have a benefit cost ratio that's above one so that it provides benefits. It's just a matter of how those benefits are tabulated, but Sarah may want to speak more to that study that, that is available out there. 
Yeah, thanks, Greg. This is Sarah. <clears throat> Excuse me, I guess I'll just chime in that yes, just to um, reflect on what you said, that work has certainly been done for the past two projects. Um, unfortunately, I don't have either of those studies handy with me today, um, but can certainly send out any follow-up information if there's specifics that are that are folks are interested in. Uh, thanks, Commissioner Malcolm. I really appreciate that. Really, definitely on target question and analysis, right? So, what would have happened to the Del Mar Bluffs, or you know, Bluffs and Solana Beach without any sand, or you know, Oceanside as well, right? Or Imperial Beach. So, I think those are great questions, right? The, the modeling that could happen and the understanding of what you're right, what might have been. Um, and Councilmember Worden, speaking of Del Mar. All right. Uh, Thank you, uh, Greg, for this uh, wonderful report. Information is power. This really helps us all understand a very complex and dynamic system. I endorse the look back comparison that uh, Member Malcolm was suggesting and want to ask two specific questions for those of us in jurisdictions that are looking forward in terms of shoreline management and beach management and dealing with sea level rise. And the first part is, in your uh, analysis to get a 50 foot wide beach, did you take into account sea level rise going forward? No, I, I did not. And you know, that's mainly because I think these uh, beach nourishment projects, I think they're, they should be viewed as maintenance rather than a capital project. So they do have generally a limited life. So, you know, we're talking somewhere from these projects here, five to, to greater than 10 years. And under the current uh, rate of sea level rise, it's so small that's not going to, to, to influence the beach width greatly over that, over say a 10 or even 15 year period. Now that might change in the future if um, the curve steepens and accelerates like, um, like is predicted for many locations. But you know, for this simplistic analysis, no, I did not include sea level rise, but I don't think it wouldn't change it much at all for the near term. Thanks for clarifying. My second question is, uh, am I right that if we don't balance the overall sand deficit in the budget by cell, uh, that uh, we're kind of shuffling chairs on the deck of the Titanic by doing projects jurisdiction by jurisdiction? Uh, aren't we really looking at an RBSP3 to fix this thing overall if we really want it to work going forward? Well, I, I think you saw that this, you know, one one reach affects the next. It, it's all interconnected in this cell, hence is why it's a literal cell or a closed system. Um, and you see that um, sand placed in Oceanside makes its way down to North Carlsbad. Sand placed in Solana Beach makes its way to Del Mar. So I think there are some benefits to, to doing a project like that, particularly because in this area we have some sensitive nearshore resources where you simply can't put 5 million cubic yards of sand in Oceanside and let it work its way down the coast like um, the Corps of Engineers does in Orange County with the you know, 1 to 2 million cubic yard slugs up at Surfside Sunset and it's been shown to uh, nourish the beaches in Huntington Cliffs, Huntington Beach, um, Huntington State Beach along the way. Thank you for answering my questions. Great. I don't see any other. Well, first, thanks you. Thanks, Councilmember Warden, um, for that. And then Greg, again, uh, thanks for the, the response. So I think what we're seeing is, and maybe I'm wrong, but really the need for again regional collaboration and and you know, sort of leveraging the, all our us to be able to work together so we can actually have this be more cost effective. Um, I think for the newer members, and I think for those of us, and again, my hats off to Councilmember Warden, who is really sort of have been involved in this these, these efforts for a long time. Um, you know, the, the term shoreline management, coastal management, coastal zone management, uh, coastal protection has been around a long time. And unfortunately, I think the way the media plays things recently with sea level rise, et cetera, all this uh, work focus on adaptation has, has come down to two words, manage retreat, rather than the whole gamut of tools and strategies we can use to, at the end of the day, which is the, the goal here is to protect the coast uh, and figure out ways to work with nature instead of against it and obviously spend money effectively. So I think that's something that I know we're going to have uh, 
we're wrapping up, but Steve Assetti from CalCoast will talk about legislative stuff. I think it is important to mention that um, we had Katie Porter, uh, the, the governor's climate uh, sort of manager, director, uh, talk to Sandag, but I had a good talk with um, uh, the head of the Ocean Protection Council, and whose name I am now blanking on because I've known him for so long, who's at UCLA, uh, I will think of it in a second. But as well, Wade Crowfoot, our, our resource secretary, really are looking at a climate bond, or they were until this crisis, and really understanding that the key to these long-term strategy and viable strategy for coastal protection and management and adaptation to sea level rise and coastal flooding is really natural climate solutions uh, doing things like the Buena Vista Lagoon or the Santa Lea Lagoon Lagoon Project, where you have these integrated infrastructure and shoreline management programs, right? That's Those are things we have to look at. So there's a whole gamut of tools that we can use that independent of just two words that uh, unfortunately the media and, and certain and a lot of folks like to, to discuss. So I think for those of us in Imperial Beach and Del Mar that have been immersed in these for a long time, like Dwight and myself and others, uh, it's been very frustrating that somehow a legacy and, and a whole process that is, is really around shoreline and coastal management was reduced to two words. And I think we're trying to, and I think you've seen that acceptance in Sacramento at some level, um, trying to dig ourselves out of that hole that we've gotten in to sort of broaden the scope of how we address these issues. So um, with that, I, um, I'm not sure if there's any other updates that you wanted to talk about, Sarah, I think there are, is that correct? Chair, I just want to confirm for the record that there are no further comments, further public comments on item five. And no, no additional comments from me, Mayor Dedina. Um, I did want to just point out, um, I think it's Deputy Mayor Hines from Encinitas. I believe had a question in the chat and I didn't know if she wanted to speak to that question before we moved on. Um, I think I understand it, but I just wanted to verify that um, the reason why the Encinitas Lucadia reach would need um, the most sand to get to the 50 foot width. And it seems like the main reason is just the length of that stretch. Is that correct? Yeah, that's the biggest piece of it. I mean, we're talking about a uh, four or five mile stretch there, uh, but it also requires the the largest uh, unit volume to reach that at 80 cubic yards per foot. That's because the the distance between the berm, top of the beach, and the depth of closure offshore is among the greatest of this region. So it's two things, but mainly, as you said, it's that length. So that depth of reach is due to higher wave action, perhaps? Yeah, it could be a higher wave exposure and Keep in mind, too, that the way we do depth of closure is based on profile changes that we see. So in places like South Carlsbad, for example, where we have a fairly shallow depth of closure, that might not necessarily be a physical depth of closure if we had more sand there. It may be limited by the sand that we have. Um, you know, we just get to reef at some point that doesn't change. Um, so at Encinitas, it's a pretty sandy reach, particularly there at Moonlight Beach, where, where it you do see that movement out to, I think it's about 25 feet of water if uh, memory serves me correct. Okay, thank you for explaining. Welcome. Great, thank you so much. And um, I know staff is working to post the most recent shoreline monitoring report that accompanies the presentation Greg gave today, and Sarah will send a link out to this group once that is posted. And then I know we did have a an update from uh, Steve Asetti from Calco. Steve, I think you have like three to five minutes to give us a little update. Um, if you're there. How do I unmute? You, you are unmuted, Mr. Assetti. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. So there are two interesting bills, uh, both authored by uh, Senator Pat Bates, who uh, is really well versed in coastal issues. She's a past chair of the California Coastal Coalition. She was uh, a council member and mayor in Laguna Niguel. She, when she was a supervisor in Orange County, she um, led meetings similar to our group, but it was for Orange County. So she's really on top of this stuff. 
And she has, um, for people interested in the toll road situation, she has a bill that will, would um, enshrine into law that no toll road extension will go through San Clemente. And that bill has passed. Um, so it looks like that has bipartisan support, which is very rare up north. Um, there's an email I sent to staff that has the, the press release about the bill. It's SB 1373. And I also included in the email a link where you can see the text of the bill, its status, uh, history, and staff analysis. Um, the more the bill is more germane to what we're doing is uh, SB 1090 from Pat Bates. And that bill is, is it's a little controversial. Um, I, unless major changes are made to it, I don't think it will pass in the Democratic Assembly and the Democratic Senate. Um, it was heard in committee last week and it was uh, pulled uh, from the committee to give um, Senator Bates and the chair of Senate Natural Resources and Water, uh, Henry Stern, a uh, chance to uh, work on the bill. But for the bill to be able to do what it's set out to do, I, you know, everyone here, especially the elected uh, officials are aware of the political realities in Sacramento. And um, uh, and I, I even remember that when we passed, I say we, the collective we, passed the uh, AB 64, the Beach Restoration Program Bill in 1999 with Duchenne, one of the concessions we had to make in order for the bill to pass was um, it had to expressly say that no money from that account could be used for structures. So there's a history to this, and I think that same kind of concern is going to hold up uh, SB 1090. And I also, in the email, I have, um, a link to the press release about the bill. And then again, the, a link to the text, status, history, staff analysis. And um, I'll keep uh, staff updated on these and, and others that are of interest. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Dino. Thank you so much, Steve. Really appreciate it. For those of you who are new to uh, the committee, Steve is legendary, long time, Coastal Advocate, really appreciate all the work you're doing in Sacramento, Steve, and, and linking that to on the ground or on the beach uh, impact. So thank you. Um, with that, I, unless there's any additional comments, are there any additional comments on Steve's uh, comments or update? Well, again, thanks everybody. Um, I think we'll wrap up the meeting today. The next Shoreline Preservation Working Group is scheduled for Thursday, September 3 at 11.30 a.m. Um, Sarah, did you have any additional comments? Um, no additional comments. Just as a reminder, I'll send out information regarding the Regional Water Quality Control Board uh, meetings this summer, a link to the Shoreline Monitoring Report, and also Steve Assetti's legislative update, and hopefully an update on receiving funding um, from Caltrans tomorrow um, as a follow-up to this meeting. Great. Thanks, Sarah. I think really, for me at least, to take away messages, the more that we can do to work together and work regionally and be proactive and prepare these projects in advance, the more that we can identify funding and then channel that down to work on projects that have an impact on our, our beaches that we need more than ever. So anyway, with that, the meeting is adjourned at 12.42 p.m. and I hope everyone has a great week and a great uh, weekend. Thank you.